Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. I have another great interview for you. This time around, I talked to Gay Dave from the from Echoplex Media. We talked politics, misinformation, and how to deal with the combination of those. This episode was live streamed uh, on Twitch at twitch.tv slash skeptical leftist on January 17th, 2022. Uh, I'm going to send you over to the interview right away, but first I want to just apologize to anyone who may have been waiting for uh, the new episode to come out. Everyone on the shift opposite of mine at work got COVID, so I was covering a few of those extra nights, and uh, then my dad got sick, and so I had to cover for him at his job. It made for a very long three weeks where I had to cancel some great interviews, and I had uh, to cancel the Red Reviews episode that we were recording, and I didn't actually publish anything for two weeks. Uh, Since my last recording, there's been a lot going on. Uh... The trucker convoy in Canada lasted for three weeks and was eventually broken up by a major police action that easily could have been carried out much earlier. Not of, of course, not that I support any police actions. I feel there could have been some other way to deal with that. Uh, Justin Trudeau enacted the Emergency Measures Act, which seemed like an overreach to me, uh, <laughs> and it didn't actually help the police take action in any way that they couldn't already. And then about five days later, he removed the emergency or shut down the Emergency Measures Act. And uh, then everything's supposedly back to normal. Also, Texas passed a law that will target families that affirm the gender identities of trans kids. And then uh, just the other day, Russia invaded Ukraine on a pretty massive scale. Uh, I'm definitely missing a lot of events in there. And a lot of these things uh, require a much more in-depth look at them, but it's nothing I have the time to do, uh, or or at least nothing I have the time to type out a fully uh, thought out uh, intro for. The news news tends to just move too fast for me when I've worked three weeks straight. Uh, You know, I have enough, I have a hard enough time keeping up when things are, uh, when I'm actually on days off. I think this is why everyone has news sources or pundits that they trust and get their opinions from most of the time. None of us actually has the time to be informed on everything, and even if we did uh, have the time, we still couldn't actually have all the facts on all the things. Uh, We do our best, find people we trust or who know more than us, and repeat a mixture of the various things we've heard. Uh, (laughs) I used to start all my opinions with, I read an article that said, uh, to the point where it actually became like a joke with my coworkers. But these days, like everyone does a very similar thing. Except instead of an article, it's usually a Facebook post or some dubious website. Um, But anyway, that's enough of an intro for this episode. Thanks to all my supporters and thank you to everyone who watches or listens. Uh, Please make sure to share the show with your friends or family who may be interested in the perspective of an anarchist who also happens to be a laborer in a conservative province. Uh, If you want to become a patron, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. Uh, or you can send me a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't support my work financially, that's fine, but a five-star rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites would be great. And make sure to follow me on Twitch so you can see the live streams of all the interviews, read reviews episodes, and all the other things that I stream. I'm also hoping to start streaming more regularly on my days off when I have them. Uh, With that, I'm going to send you over to the interview with Gay Dave from Echoplex Media. All right. Hi, and welcome to, from uh, from many people's strength, this is not that podcast. Hi, and welcome to uh, The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, uh, the podcast where I spread critical thinking, left-wing politics, and uh, yeah, I've lost my, I've lost my game. I haven't done this in a long time. (laughs) <laughs> and today I'm here with Gay Dave from Echoplex Media. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me on. I hope your uh, Twitch viewers like the uh, special effects on my webcam. I think my webcam is just kind of broken and it's flashing a little bit. <laughs> yeah, in and out, in and out, eh? It's probably, it's some white balance shit. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's in the settings somewhere. I'll fix it, whatever. Yeah, that's always what causes it. 
I guess a good place to start, though, is a little bit about yourself and your show. Uh, yeah, we're live actually on Twitch every night or almost every night because things are halfway opening up again. So we like to go out on the weekends like I'm a DJ and I play shows and stuff. So sometimes Fridays or Saturdays, we're not here, but uh, I can give kind of a quick rundown of the shows. I've gotten good at this uh, Sunday night. Last night is our big our big show, the big show. It's like our weekly news rundown. It's the Plex. We do uh, just kind of the news of the week, but we don't do like horse race politics and stuff. We kind of keep an eye on like the conspiracy community and like extremism and what's been going on with, you know, some of our favorite characters from the past have been like Jacob wall, um, right. Jack Berkman. Uh, currently we're kind of keeping an eye on that negative 48 cult. but then Monday right now, actually I'm kind of cheating on my co-host. She's doing something called meltdown Monday. Um, she's been covering a lot of what's going on in Northern, Northern California, Shasta County. There's a bit of an uprising there with some uh, right wing lunatics right. trying to take over the city government uh, through through a means other than an election. And so she's got some family up there. Her, her kid's dad and her kids live up there. So she's been kind of keeping an eye on that even before she started streaming about it. Now she's streaming about it. Tuesday, we do wow. local news and then a local music podcast. That's the night nobody watches our channel, but that's fine. Wednesday, we do the intellectual <laughs> Dollar Tree. That's a. Uh, that podcast, when we put that the podcast of that out, that actually charts on iTunes, which is pretty cool. It's the first nice. podcast we ever did, and it's making fun of the intellectual dark web. Thursdays is probably cool. the funnest night. We do Cults in the Satanic Panic. It started out, we were just covering Scientology, but we had to broaden it out a little bit as that news cycle um, kind of came to an end as the cult becomes less and less popular. Friday, we do Conspiracy Bingo, and then Saturday, we do Operation Catterday, which is just anything i usually end up djing till three in the morning and drinking half a bottle of vodka so that's <laughs> nice. kind of what we do and of those the things that are released as a podcast are the plex that's sunday the news show down ballad is our local news show local love is our music show and then the intellectual dollar tree and then sometimes if there are interesting segments from some of the other shows maybe they'll make it to the feed for the sunday show because that's you know where people kind of go first to look at stuff for us and other than that we have a blog on our website that we never write anything on and um we have our own wiki <laughs> which is pretty cool and uh, we have an internet radio station you can go to eplex.xyz anytime we're not live and all of our we have like over 1500 tracks by local artists that have sent us their music over the years and that's just all on shuffle wow. so nice. we you know we got a lot going on it's a lot of fun it's a second job but <clears throat> before it wasn't paying me anything now it's starting to pay like some non-insignificant portion of my bill so it's not the worst second job in the world yeah i mean if you can get a little bit of income out of it it's uh I mean, the guy, a guy does it out of passion, right? But, uh, if you can help pay the bills, that's definitely great. Or even if like, if I go replace all the cables, like it's somebody else replacing all the cables in this right overly complicated studio I've built in a spare room here, but like more, <laughs> more about myself, I guess I've been monitoring like extremism and conspiracy theories online since I've been online. It's always been kind of fascinating to me. Like when I was younger, I loved the X files. Like, you know, it's. Everybody I meet that's an anti-conspiracy theorist actually loves the X-Files. They liked Mulder, but, but they identified with Scully. You know, you can see I right. even have a, yeah. a poster back here. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's just always been interesting to me. And my interest in Scientology is in, in 2004, uh, one of my best friends uh, ran off and joined the mothership in Clearwater. And I've been fascinated with Scientology ever since. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's wild. Uh, and I DJ. Did... I've been DJing since I was like 16 when I wanted drums. And my mom was like, well, you know... Um, did you know that a DJ mixer has a volume knob? And I said, "Why, well, yes, it does. And, yeah. and my mom was always into disco and stuff. So she was like, well, this is something I'd be more willing to tolerate listening to as well. So that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Drums are quite the ask. <laughs> yep. We have jokes I have in San Jose. I don't live specifically in San Jose, but I live in a city next to it. We have a joke that there's like five drummers and each of them are in seven bands because nobody has a place to practice with drums here. Cause it's like everybody lives in an apartment, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so wh I'm curious about your friend that joined Scientology. Like, did they, uh, like join full hog right away or like, um, without maybe giving out too much personal information or whatever, uh, her mother was a Scientologist and her mother passed away and, uh, she went to see some of the people there because they were close to her mother and they just roped her in. She was like in yeah. a vulnerable spot and they just roped her in. Um, she was always kind of one of those, everything is energy people. And so right. it's, it's, 
it's not that those are the kinds of people who join cults, all different kinds of people join cults. But if you, yep. you know, it's not surprising that is an, an ener- everything is energy kind of person would join a cult. You know, we, yeah, we all met it. Just type people yeah. are like, yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. vulnerable to it. Although I guess everybody is at times, right? Right. That's one of the things that I learned is that it's not, you know, it's not just the, the weird lady at the crystal shop or whatever that might uh, join a cult. It could be any of us. So we all kind of got to keep our eye out for when we join groups, just to see if they're yeah. controlling and trying to tell us a little bit too much of what we can and can't do, you know? For sure. Oh, and people can so, find my stuff at echoplexmedia.com. Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Mr. I'll just, just, just put it in the show notes. It's, I don't even remember how my Twitter <laughs> handle is spelled. And uh, we're on Facebook because we have to be and uh, twitch.tv slash yep. Echoplex Media. Yeah, everybody's on Facebook uh, to some degree. Same with Twitter. Oh, I love Twitter. <laughs> I yeah. love Twitter. I've been blocked by the entire intellectual dark web except Eric Weinstein. Oh, why do you think that is? Um, I'm sorry, except Brett Weinstein. Um, I don't know because oh. I talk I, I talk mad shit to them and I have a podcast making fun of them. And so Yeah, well, that, that could do it. I guess Brett Weinstein is probably the uh, least harmful of the group. Oh, I disagree. He's an anti. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Eric. I thought Eric's, that was Eric. Eric is uh, no. Eric's the guy who thinks he unified physics in his spare time all by himself, oh, like yeah, on the back of a right. napkin. <laughs> 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 that's delusional, but harmless. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to keep track of them uh, and their weirdness. Well, yeah. I mean, not not everybody's that interested in it either. I checked out some of your content. You do no content on them, so it's not surprising that you haven't you don't you don't like have an encyclopedic knowledge of which one of them is <laughs> which particular kind of cult leader and what kind of delusions they have so that's probably better for you honestly yeah i i try to stick to things like uh positive things because i don't want to be online all the time just being mad so <laughs> well that's the thing is i'm not really mad like it's just funny to make fun of people like i've always thought it was funny to, you know i don't i don't like i don't you know i don't we don't as, as an organization, we've always been, um, making fun of people, conspiracy theories and stuff, conspiracy theorists and stuff. We don't abuse people or stalk or harass anyone, but right. it's a, it's, it's a lot of fun to poke fun at people who think they've cracked the code, man. That's the, it's the best. No, that's good. I, uh, I guess I have a tendency to get really frustrated when people are saying like really, uh, untrue things. <laughs> so, so when I see somebody like, uh, uh, an Eric Weinstein or whatever saying something that's nonsense, then I, I, I try to avoid it because I do get worked up pretty easy. I think like, <clears throat> I think, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, for people to like, like tell the difference, whereas the difference between like you're worked up and you're mad or like, you no, know, you can't, like you care about this issue and you don't want people spreading misinformation. Like on the other end of that, it often looks the same, but I'm not sitting there fucking fuming when I'm on Twitter. Right. It's, it's right. I, I care about the things I'm talking about, but I'm not fucking angry while I'm on there. That's, that's like a, that's like, a, I'm, I'm getting up there in years. I'm 45 years old, man. I'll give myself a stroke if I like get too mad at everything. Like well, you see, gotta, you gotta be yeah. able to laugh at it or, or you're just not like cut out for the war of bad ideas or whatever, you know? Well, and that's, that's exactly it. Like that's uh, again, I'm, I'm roughly the same age. I'm, I'm 44 turning 45 this year. And like I say, like my, my frustration level gets way too high if I interact with them too closely. So I'm just not, I'm just not there for the culture wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, unfortunately vaccines have now become a culture war issue and that's uh, like, that's, yes. that's, that's, that's starting to make me mad. Um, real quick though, I do want to kind of shout out the other people that work with me. Uh, the media wench sure. right now, Ashley, she's live, uh, HK Perrin. He does Silicon Valley skeptics and he's the co-host of, uh, the intellectual dollar tree with me. Um, the, Shout out to the creator of the intellectual dollar tree, uh, RIP, our good friend, Joe, the breadboard baker, uh, passed away uh, after leaving our studio one night. Actually, it was quite sad, but oh, um, yeah. he'd be pretty proud. Of, he'd be pretty proud of what happened with that show. I think um, historian Matt, who uh, moved to Florida, but he's still my co-host sometimes for the news show. And uh, my good friend, Chip DeVille, uh, co-host of Local Love and, so, and my fucking big titty goth girls. Uh, particularly star and Kenzie, they'll come on our cults and satanic panic show and talk a little bit of shit sometimes. And so and we like to raid out, like when we have a good crowd, we like to raid out to our, uh, goth DJ friends so that, uh, after we've like polluted people's minds or whatever, they can just listen to some music and chill out. So right on. Uh, I've got a couple comments here from, uh, some random geek on, uh, Twitch. 
uh, said, I, I care about politics. Talking about politics and conversing with conservatives can really work me up, which, yep. Yeah, I mean, I take all comers like via Discord voice kind of late at night on my channel. <clears throat> and I I got to tell you that I'm way better at that than I used to be. I used to get fucking pissed off right? at people, honestly. <laughs> <clears throat> now I like, I like try to like, like talk people down from their extreme positions in so far as I can. Right. I'm not mm. going to talk everybody out of everything, but in so far as I can, I, I, if I, if I think I can, I try to talk people down, try to talk people out of some of their bigotries or at least get them to soften their bigotries when I can, but it's super frustrating. And it's, <clears throat> it's more frustrating. I think via text, like in comment threads, especially on Facebook, because right. people are way more dug in, in that environment versus like, if you're actually talking to somebody. So I've, Sure. I've, di I've stopped arguing with everyone on Facebook because I'm about to get kicked off that fucking website. I've been in 30 J <laughs> day Facebook jail for so many. Now I'm just like, I'm just like, Oh, Hey everybody, my friend's band's playing, go to the show, buy me a beer, you know, just like yeah. really nice stuff. I was running with a group of trolls on there and I like, <clears throat> like separated myself from that. Cause it was, you know, I was just always in Facebook jail and like, you shouldn't really need four Facebook accounts just to manage a page, just to make sure that like not right. all of your accounts are in Facebook jail. But I do yeah. understand like arguing with people via text, it like dehumanizes them in a way. And <clears throat> so I've kind of gone more towards like, if people really want to get into it with me on Twitter, I'm like, Hey, you know, my show's over around nine 30 tonight. You know, here's my discord. Feel free to hop in the voice chat. I'd love to have a conversation. Cause otherwise you end up going around in circles and then both yeah. of you end up looking crazy to everyone watching. And then it's just not good for anyone. Whereas, whereas just if you're talking to somebody, you can eventually kind of find some points of agreement or in some cases you, I feel like I've been able to talk a few people off of some crazy ledges that they were on. So Oh, that's but I, really do, good. I do, yeah. I do know what your, I do know what your, um, you know, what your, your commenter is saying. And I, I used to be in that shit. Like I, I was arguing with people on Usenet back in the day. So it's uh right. Right. So it's, it's yeah, definitely it's, difficult. Yeah. There's something about the text. Like I used to, I used to think Facebook was better than Twitter for that, but it, it, it actually seems now like it's worse. Cause you, now you can type out a whole screed. I think you've made some point <laughs> And, and nobody reads it and then they just call you names. But, so it's like, what's the point? Yeah, it's, I think the other thing that's going on on Facebook, honestly, is that to, you know, if like, if there's like some interpersonal conflict going on in my friend group, that's at the top of my feed on Facebook. And it seems to optimize right. in a way for conflict. Whereas Twitter, you're never going to see that again if you're not commenting on it. It's not going to be showing up at the top of your Twitter feed because that's not how Twitter works. Twitter's about what's going on now. Facebook wants you to fight with your friends, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, and they, they even said that, I think, like in some of these uh, releases that came out in the last year is like, yeah, if it made people angry, they would opt. it was optimized to put that at the top of the feed if somebody was angry reacting or it was getting a lot of uh, angry reactions on comments and whatnot yeah i never use the angry react if i'm gonna if i'm gonna if i think somebody's full of shit i use the laughing react <laughs> there was this yeah, chemtrails I, uh, guy there was this chemtrails oh. guy named peter ferris who i think we eventually deprogrammed but he would post shit he would like refer to his feed as the front page of facebook or the main page of facebook and then people would leave laughing reacts and he was this uh, guy from like uh, like the northern uk somewhere and he would be like he would be like laughing smoilies everywhere and it was just so funny <laughs> we were <laughs> but nice yeah yeah i think we ended up deprogramming him he we got him in the discord we got him in our discord one night and a few of us kind of talked him out of all that shit it's actually on our podcast feed it's like the deprogramming of peter ferris he doesn't believe in chemtrails anymore but he's spreading a bunch of anti-vaccine bullshit so I don't know. You take the small victories, I guess, where you can get yeah, them. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's, I know a lot of people like now are, are really grabbing onto the anti-vax stuff. It's, uh, I don't know. It's really hard to combat in any real way. Well, one of the reasons is like, so if you talk to a conspiracy theorist, right, they're going to have their five or six little factoids ready that they just hammer on. And even the people I know, like a um, couple people that I'm really the Q Origins project. I've had all those guys on my stream. Uh, they're all, they're all, they're doing like research on like uh, basically what was going on on four and eight chan. 
they're not prepared to argue with a chemtrails person about like whether a high bypass right. turbo fan engine creates a contrail. But that chemtrail person sure is willing to tell you that they shouldn't unless there's barium in there. And then like, what are you going to do? Like, how do you think? <laughs> so what I, you know, I've had a few people kind of come to me, like people in my community on discord, they're like, Hey, you know, how do I, what do I do about this stuff? How do I deal with this? And I was like, Hey, you know, you're not going to be an expert on all this stuff. You're not going to yeah. be a vaccine expert. You're not going to be a virologist. And then I always tell them, if you'd like to go to school to be a virologist, please do. We could probably use a few more virologists. You seem curious, yep. whatever. Don't know how old <laughs> any of these people are, right? But it's the patterns. It's spotting the patterns. It's spotting like the dishonest ways people talk about things, the sort of ways people try to manipulate the conversation. It's being able to spot what a conspiracy look, theory looks like and how it's constructed. That's way more important than me knowing anything actually about right, the contents right. of any given vaccine, for example, you know? And it's not the answer people want because they want that slam dunk that's going to get their uncle to like change his mind, but you're not going to do it. Like somebody might do it, but it's not likely to be you. It's if, if, you know, if it's an uncle, you hardly it see it. might won't be, a, be in the moment, right? Like while you're right. arguing to with them, like well, uh, it, that's one thing I had to, I had to like take to heart was that you'll never convince somebody in front of others in the moment the, if they think about it later, maybe they will come to a different conclusion, but. Um, I think I only did it once. Some guy came into chat and was like, oh, you know, what are you doing talking about Brett Weinstein? He's a scientist. And then after the show, people were like, hey, come back later. We're not going to argue with you right now. They're recording their podcast. Like my chat's really good about that. They're like, if you're going to sit here and argue, we're going to end up muting you for an hour anyway. So just come right. back in an hour. And the guy came in and he was like, oh, I'm skeptical of this and skeptical of that and this and that. And I'm like, well, why aren't you skeptical of what Brett Weinstein's telling you? He's like, right. you know, I never thought about that. And then three days, three days later, he came back into my chat and was like, you know what? You're right. He's like, I should be skeptical of Brett Weinstein. Thanks. But it's the only time it's ever happened in the moment for me in front of an audience. <laughs> right. And to be yeah. fair, it was a long time. It was kind of a long time ago. So the calling what we had then an audience wasn't, isn't really accurate. <laughs> like three drunk people in Australia is not an audience. <laughs> what well, counts? I'm calling that counts. <laughs> Oh, also shout out to our Australian day drinking team. We couldn't do the show without you. There you go. So you, you guys have been doing the show for quite a while then. Like I, th I seem to recall it was hot. You were doing it before I ended brainstorm. The first release of the podcast, the, the Sunday show was, um, and it wasn't always on Sunday. Um, it was, uh, summer of 2015. Okay. Yep. Yeah. But so we had, we had the website ago, actually. We had the website prior to that. We had a couple blog posts up. We weren't sure what to do. Like we weren't, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Like I had, I'd stopped throwing raves and I needed something to do. Um, you know, trying to, trying to get bookings at everybody's parties as I got older was a little tough. And I was like, well, <clears throat> you know, I'd been producing music most of my adult life and that wasn't really going anywhere. But I was like, you know, I know a lot about audio and I have some things to say. I don't imagine hooking a microphone up to this shit's going to be that functionally different than trying to write a beat as far as like making it sound good. And I got a couple friends together. The, you know, the, the cast of characters has changed a lot over the years. The guy I uh, started it with uh, no longer works on it at all. Um, but yeah, we've since 2015 though, like honestly it took us like two years to really even kind of figure out what we were doing, like where we were going, what our focus was going to be, you know, it, that's it, normal. <laughs> You know, we just kind of, and I was under the impression, I was like, oh, if I put out a high quality product that sounds like it was done in a professional studio, but it's done in my living room, you know, people are going to want to check it out. And that was incorrect. Actually, you have to have something <laughs> that people want to listen to. It doesn't matter how good it sounds. It turns out. Right. Right. And funny thing is some people will listen to like audio. That's terrible. If the thing they're listening to is interesting to them. Yeah. And I think there's another thing about that. And I've been kind of workshopping it in my head, right? Cause <clears throat> we do, we will run some clips of people interviewing, uh, Eric Weinstein. He's the, he works for Peter Thiel. He's worth like 70 million or $80 million. And his right. audio is always so scuffed and it's not for his inability to put together a good audio product. I mean, he could just pay someone else to set up a studio, but I'm starting yeah. to think that that might be a strategy that it might seem more authentic to certain kinds of people. If you don't sound like you're sitting in a sound room, right? I haven't, right. I haven't worked, I haven't worked it out in my mind all the way yet, but I think like when you watch conspiracy videos and they sound bad, I think maybe to the target audience, it seems authentic. It seems off the cuff. 
Whereas what we're doing here is obviously pre-planned to the extent that both of us <laughs> right. put together a studio, right? Yeah, that's right. Whereas this guy is just in his kitchen in his $7 million house or whatever somewhere. I don't know where he lives, probably Malibu, but these people all live in Malibu. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think that, I think there's, you know, there's something to that. And I, I, I haven't thought about it much and I only ever think about it kind of late at night on the stream. And it's just me thinking out loud and the people in the chat are just like, no, this guy's just an idiot. And I'm like, but he's rich. You don't have to know right. how to hook up shit. You could hire somebody. Yeah, so I'm just thinking right. that there's there's some kind of like implied or inferred authenticity to people just kind of talking into their tablet or their phone. I was talking, my partner, she does like, she has a, a background in communication and media. And she said, like, I do tons of editing on the YouTube version of my show. And she said, like, you shouldn't actually do that because people want that raw version of everything. They want to see the, the scuffs and the silences and the ums and the ahs. I hate that, but apparently that's what's popular. Yeah. We used to, I used to multi-track everything out. Like I would, you know, there's 16 channels on the interfaces here and whatnot. And each of them would get their own channel when we were doing the podcast and I'd compress every channel and run a noise gate on it. Nope. Now we just release the stereo out. I hack off the, be I hack off everything before the start of the podcast and everything where, you know, after the, at the end of the podcast. And I just release that because the, one, now I don't have time, but two, like when we started doing that and when I started explaining to guests and co-hosts that like, Hey, we have one take, like you got to come right. ready to play. You got to come like ready Make to work, <laughs> ready to like stop talking. If two people are talking, because this is like live to tape. And, uh, everything we just, people, more people started listening, even though, you know, you, you know, you do, you know, when you're like thinking and stuff <laughs> and people get that on the show, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely better, I think. And, um, you know, the, if you listen to the most popular podcasts, it's like that it's generally unedited. Also yeah. three hours fucking long. Sometimes our streams are really long, but I don't release nothing over about an hour 20 to Spotify or whatever. There's no yeah. way anybody's going to listen to me, <laughs> me yell about anti-vaccine videos for three hours on, on Spotify. But for whatever reason, people tune in for it on Twitch. Seems, seems weird. Yeah. I guess everybody's got their preferences, right? Like I, I've even talked to people like that prefer scripted podcasts and I do my intros scripted, but uh, you didn't do that this time. Well, no, I, I, I do it separately or record it separately. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole separate process. <laughs> so the, I guess the show that sort of, that sort of taught me that, at least for me, that it's better to just do a live to tape is the majority report because that shit's live mm -hmm. to tape. Yeah. It, it's straight up live to tape and it's a high quality show. It sound the sound is good. The content's usually right. pretty good. The interview guests are good. There's ums and ahs and people like halfway through their sentence correcting themselves because they're like, actually, I meant to say this, but it's actually, it's good, you know? And I think yeah. that, and I think that, you know, for me, that's better because otherwise I'm, I'm just one of the, I would just, when I was editing, I would sweat every little detail of it and it like kind of took the life out of the show. And then I was exhausted by the time the show got out. I hated it and I didn't want to like promote it and <laughs> right. like I I wouldn't go back and ever listen to it because I had listened to so many parts of it. Now, every week I try to listen to like two of the shows that went out and kind of like take mental notes. Okay. That didn't work. That did work. I got to tell my co-host that actually if we're both talking because I'm the one in dealing with things in real time, he needs to stop. Not me, you know, that kind of stuff, you know? And, um, before I was completely unable to get, to even get myself to listen to any of my stuff afterwards. Yeah. Now it's in my Spotify queue. I know I shouldn't use Spotify, but whatever. I'm on an Android phone. The, the, the pickings are pretty slim. Fucking Stitcher is the worst app. And the Google Podcasts app, I don't know if they've even done anything with it since they put it out. No, um, it's terrible. <laughs> but now my shows are just in my queue. And if they come up, if, I, if there's not something I'm dying to listen to, I'll just listen to it while I'm like doing work or whatever. And it's, it, it helps a lot. Whereas before, there was just no way I was going to do it. I was so sick of the fucking show by the time I, you know, by the time I put it out. Yeah, I can, I can relate to that. I, uh, doing all the editing for multiple shows, it's, it's, it's exhausting. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's fun though. It's, it's actually yeah. the, the more, the more nights a week we're live and the less percentage of the stuff we actually put out as a podcast, the more fun it is. And the more, 
the more traction the podcasts seem to be getting. And then that drives people to the, to the live shows. Cause they're like, well, what do you mean it's over? They just said it's not over, but now my podcast player is done. What do you mean? What are you doing? No, I'm not giving right. you $5 for the MP3 on Patreon. Maybe <laughs> I'll just join your Twitch channel and watch it next week. Yeah. Uh, some random geek said, and, uh, some random geek is a patron. So I, I think this is fair. Uh, that's how our podcast is run. Social justice, alchemy, uh, a great show on YouTube every Sunday. So, Oh, cool. Did you know I got kicked off of YouTube? Oh, is that right? Yeah. You know what I did? (laughs) What'd you do? I covered two local government meetings that anti-vaxxers had brigaded via Zoom call. And um, and we were covering it live. And then I put segments of it out on YouTube like I was doing regularly. And they fucking hit both of those for uh, misinformation. And then some old show that we had on there, like for audio only from 2018, got hit for like, bullying or something and i couldn't oh, even and they, they like i was like kind of mad because i was like well wait a minute where did the people that were saying the misinformation at the city council meeting they learned it on youtube <laughs> like yeah that's and right we, we were covering it and talking shit about them and you kicked us off i know it's just an algorithm no no human being looked at it but it's like you know they were repeating things that brett weinstein was saying and it's like well why aren't you kicking brett weinstein off if they're repeating yeah. this, you know, if they're repeatedly talking about ivermectin, then why is Brett Weinstein allowed to do that? But sure. we're not, you know, <clears throat> I don't want the sense. city, go- I don't want the city government getting their YouTube channel shut down for that, by the way, because those are just public right. comments. They have no control over it. So my, my argument wasn't, oh, well, why aren't you shutting down the city of San Jose or the county of Santa Clara? My argument was like, hey, they learned this on your website. You know, they were just repeating things they had heard from anti-vaccine creators that you suggest and the people at YouTube. Like I got a hold of them on on Twitter and they're like, no, you violated the policy. And I'm like, you know, what? go fuck yourself. Isn't there like a, a use of reporting on it sort of thing where you were, you can do that. Well, right. But I mean, in the end it's their party, like, right. I'm not going to scream from the top of the building that I've been silenced or cancel cultured or whatever. Yeah. No, it It was just, uh, it was just inconsistent. Yeah. It was just dumb. It's not like we made any money on there or anything, but you know, we were making some money on AdSense on our website, but now we're making some money through some other ad provider on our website because I'm like, you don't want my content on your website. Well, I'm not going to use your ad ad platform then. Fuck you. Yeah. There you go. Like our email for the the, the podcast was through uh, Gmail. Now it's not. Now I, now we have another provider for our email. Like I was just like, well, I don't give you a lot of money, but now I'm giving you none. Fuck you. Yeah. There you go. It's, it's gotta be hard for them to do that, I guess, to, to moderate everything. But there's some examples that are just so blatant. Like Jimmy Dore lately has been yep. doing a lot of anti-vaccine content. Um, Brett Weinstein's probably the most popular anti-vaccine creator on YouTube. And it's like, these examples are so blatant. And, you know, if you're going to kick people off for even talking about the stuff, you know, smaller creators or like a friend of mine, ex Utah outcasts got a couple strikes oh, yep. for doing the yep. same thing. Uh, my friend, Justin, Justin freaking got a couple strikes for basically doing the same thing. And it's like, if you're going to be giving us strikes, so what are you doing? Why aren't you, you know, why isn't it like, why aren't you the, the people you know about whose channels are now anti-vaccine channels? Why are you suggesting them to me? Why aren't you doing something about that? And I think it's, I think I honestly think it's when they take down a bunch of channels for misinformation and then they'll go tell like business insider. Oh, we took down, you know, 35,000 misinformation channels. They actually don't care what was on the channel. They care about being <laughs> right. able to tell Business Insider that they took down 35,000 channels and Business Insider will just credul- credulously report their press releases if they've done the investigation and not ask for examples of the content that was taken down. And so people, you know, like my account was probably my account and my videos were probably included in whatever number they gave out, even though yep. I'm not an anti-vaccine channel. So it's all kind of optics and kind of playing hide the ball. So that every, you know, every six months or nine months, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, they all tell these credulous people in the press that they're doing something about the anti-vaccine movement. And then the press outside of like a few tech outlets, like the verge does a really good job of being like, no, you're not. And Kara Swisher from the New York times and pivot podcast. It's like, no, you're not. But everybody else is like, oh, look, they're doing something about the vaccine misinformation. And I'm like, wait a minute. Didn't you write the same article six months ago? (laughs) Why did if they did something about it six months ago, why would they have to do something about it now? Yeah, that's right. 
It makes me think of uh, Facebook doing uh, their anti-extremist sweep of pages, and and they took up like the same number of left-wing pages and ch- and and uh, accounts as they did far-right extremists. And then they go, oh yeah, we got all these extremists off of Facebook. Right. But then some of them turned out to be like mutual aid groups that just called themselves anti-fascist action. But it's like, no, these are, this was a mutual aid group. What are you doing? These are the good guys. (laughs) Well, I mean, Facebook is clearly a conservative company. Like they're, they're messaging, they're, they're trying, they're trying to appeal to conservatives. It's clear. And I think what happened there is for a long time, you know, like, if you're say say you're uh, playing just let's say soccer right or football if you live somewhere else you can play the game or if you think the game's going to be close you can play the ref and so I think in a lot of cases the a lot of conservatives got good at playing the ref and just pre-accusing Facebook and other uh, other platforms of silencing them when no yeah. silencing was happening and then these platforms got so afraid of being accused of bias because they're right here in the Bay Area with me they're staff is going to be a bunch of liberals right and so right. it's easy to make that accusation because of the zip code they occupy and so i think you know i think the conservatives did a really good job of playing the ref and saying that we're being uh mistreated by these big platforms because of our views yep for sure and yeah it's even uh like my dad believes that facebook has an anti-conservative bias <laughs> and it's like okay but if, why do you believe that? Well, there's people that compile the top, you know, 10 or 20 stories every day on Facebook. And it's always like the Daily Wire and Dan Bongino. And yeah. um, I forget who else it always is. Breitbart but it's like, or whatever. Um, usually not Breitbart anymore. They got smacked around for that a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's usually like Ben Shapiro, Michael Knowles. Sometimes it's like Turning Point USA content. And somewhere right. in there will be like occupied Democrats with their whack ass clickbait, like right in the middle. And it's like, oh, why? Right. Are they? Oh, that sucks too, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why are you? Yeah, it's it's weird. But like I said, they've just played the ref. They, it, it's a pretty smart move, all things considered. And yeah, for sure, you know, there's no evidence that that Facebook is uh, pushing down conservative content in, in their. Um, you know what is what do they call it? The search rank. I forget what the name of it is exactly. I used to know this stuff. Um, yeah, there's just no evidence of it based on what the, you know, the top content is on there. But if, if people, you know, if people like Ben Shapiro and Dan Bongino and Charlie Kirk and everybody just keep saying that's what they're doing, then, you know, eventually that becomes the talking point of the entire conservative movement. And then, you know, it's not an insignificant number of people and Facebook's maybe afraid of them. You also have to remember that I think it was 2004. 15 or 2016 some woman who was spreading misinformation on youtube had her channel demonetized and she showed up at the youtube campus with a firearm and shot out some of the windows and stuff so like i don't think that that's the specific thing that's like but things like that kind of loom large like right yeah you know you know they don't want a bunch of wackos showing up at their headquarters and so sure like, what are the liberals going to do if uh, the liberals and the leftists, what if we're <laughs> mad at Facebook, we're going to go have a drum circle in front of their headquarters with a sign, smoke some weed out there or whatever. Like, we're not going to do anything to them. We'll complain about it. I will start only going on Facebook once a month or something. I only use it for what it was originally supposed to be for is to keep up with friends of mine who refuse to leave Facebook. <laughs> right. Like we yeah. do a local music show and that entire community will not leave Facebook. They're all on there, but they all complain that Facebook said, Hey, build your brand here, build your brand here. And for a long time, they were getting reach with their posts and stuff. Now, one of the most popular bands in San Jose, sometimes uh, the singer was saying, sometimes our posts get seven impressions and they have thousands of followers. And then Facebook's like, Hey, buy an ad. And it's like, so they pulled the rug out from under a lot of like musicians, but then where are these people going to go? You know? They can't go to Twitter. If they start a discord community, that's slow going. You, you started a discord community. You know that it's, it's slow going until, <laughs> yep. I mean, it was slow going for us until we like, in, basically once we hit about 300 people, then it started being like more people were joining more quickly or whatever. Oh, but, okay. But you know, you can't do Instagram because you can't post links there. Right. And so for, I don't know how other music scenes are maybe in New York, it's all over Twitter, but in the San Francisco Bay area, it's all Facebook and nobody sees anybody's posts and there's nothing any of them could do about it. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's set up for everybody to fail really. 
Well, I guess you could run ads and then people will see it. But, but if you're a, st- a small band who doesn't have a lot of uh, cash, that can be difficult too, right? Right. Um, also, the events, they like don't let you invite a lot of people anymore. You can only invite a certain amount of people. Then you got to ask your friends to invite people to the event. And it's like. Right. Yeah, they they like really pulled the the rug out from from basically anybody trying to promote anything that isn't happening on Facebook. And it's pretty bad. It's bad for the arts. And now Facebook is basically doing to the rest of the world what the tech community, what the tech community has done to San Jose. They're like destroying art, 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 music and any kind of cultural stuff that's going on here. <laughs> Even before the pandemic, Dan, downtown San Jose was a ghost town because like women did not want to go out and get hit on by some weird tech bro, you know? And, and that's all that Go would figure. happen. <laughs> you know, the, the gay bar, the gay bar, like there's more women at the gay bar than anywhere else. But that's also because the bar here splash is like, like you could eat off of the floor at midnight there. That place is so clean, but wow. um, yeah, it's social like Facebook's pretty bad. And like I, what they've done to like the music community is second only to what Spotify does to musicians, honestly. Right. Right. Yeah. If I had, <laughs> any better way of getting at music other than Spotify, I would be using it. But, uh, unfortunately, all the artists we talk to really like Bandcamp as a, oh, as yeah, a place yeah. to dis- to distribute their music because Bandcamp, like it's not algorithmically driven. You know, if you go there looking for something, you're going to find it, but like people aren't yeah. just hanging out on Bandcamp all day listening to me. I mean, I'm sure there are, but most sure. people are just on Spotify, letting it keep suggesting stuff to them. And it sucks. Yeah. Cause like, I know, a, <clears throat> I know a band, they just hit over like a million followers on TikTok and they can't, they made like 80 bucks last year on Spotify. Oh my God. <laughs> they're like, they're like about to become like, they were a local act and then they were a regional act and they're about to be a national act and they made 80 fucking dollars on Spotify. Unbelievable. It, and it's, <clears throat> you know, you, you know, you, uh, you talk a little bit about like, workers workers rights and people being paid for their their people being compensated yep. for their labor and it's really interesting seeing what the social media companies have done to musicians yeah talk about wage theft right and think about think yeah spotify think about they're <laughs> not only they're taking they're taking the money that they could be giving to these music artists and they're giving it to joe rogan to lie to you about vaccines <laughs> like it's yep. like not only are they not paying you they've given your fucking money to some asshole who's yeah. got like this big following who he's lying to about vaccination. That's great. You know, that's, I'm sure artists are real happy with that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, we're at about 40 minutes. Uh, why don't we hop into, I guess we've kind of been covering a lot of it already, but counter propaganda. So, uh, kind of have, uh, COVID and vaccine mis- misinformation and its origins in previous conspiracy movements. So I guess vaccine, uh, like vac- anti-vaxxers have been around for a long time, right? I mean, they've been like people kind of uh, say, people kind of say the modern movement was started by Andrew Wakefield and Jenny McCarthy. Right. Um, shout out to Oprah, by the way, for platforming those people. Great job. Oprah. Mm. Good fucking Thank job. You. Larry King, you did it. You did it, man. Good job. Thanks. Thanks so much for deciding that's what you're going to put on your fucking show. Good job. Also, thanks for giving us Dr. Oz. Love you. Um, <laughs> But no, it it's the, the, the anti-vaxxers were like waiting for a moment like this. I think the ones who were yeah. smart, the ones who knew kind of how to message because the messaging isn't any different. Um, prior to the, um, prior to COVID, one of the most disturbing things we saw an anti-vaxxer do is, I don't know if you're aware of a guy named Del Bigtree. He does a thing called the high wire. Um, he's been deplatformed from everything except Twitter, but on Twitter, he's basically only telling people to watch his show now, but at some event, He was like claiming that somehow the Jewish community tended to be anti-vaccine, which uh, didn't seem to be borne out by the numbers. Um, But then he slapped on a yellow star onto himself saying that we will not, you know, succumb to this Nazi shit or whatever. Right. And that got picked up in a big way under COVID, even down to the star. And it's, and it's, it's the, you know, that's just like the primary example of that happened before COVID. Um, we also saw sort of the merging of the anti-vaccine movement with like far right agitators in, I think, 2018 here in California, there was a Senate bill SB 276, 
where a bunch of people showed up at the Capitol to protest. And it wasn't just anti-vaxxers. There were Proud Boys there. Uh, Mike Cernovich was there reporting live from it. Reporting right. live on Mike Cernovich. I'm Mike yeah. Cernovich. You, you know, he was, um, <clears throat> I guess he wasn't writing another book on how to get away with sexual assault. He was going to like jump on the anti-vaccine movement. So we started to see that kind of coming together in some weird ways. And then under the pandemic, it came together like in a real, really yeah. demonstrable way. All those, all those weird fucking libertarians going into the shops without their masks with a megaphone. I mean, yep. the seeds of that had already been like laid by the anti-vaccine movement. Um, also interesting to note that SB 276 protest was partially funded by a, a rich Scientologist. His name is Jonathan Lockwood. Um, he's not rich, but he's got connect. He's a Scientologist. He's not rich himself, but he was a main organizer and he was using money from uh, rich people in the church of Scientology to fund a guy uh. named Joshua Coleman. Uh, he most famous for uh, keying a car in a school parking lot and then hiding from the cops in a trash can, um, trash oh, can Josh, <laughs> but you know, that's funny, but the, you know, the sort of moneyed interests getting involved in the anti-vaccine movement was already starting to happen. And I'm sure it was happening in other ways that I wasn't aware of um, prior, but then COVID hit and it was just, it was just like a ready-made grift for people who were like, Hey, you know, I bet some people don't like the mask. And then the vaccine came and they're like, there's a lot of people who are anti-vax. Let's see if we can grift those people. And then the movement got bigger, but the the sort of tactics and the rhetoric are all the same. We don't know what's in the vaccine. The vaccine's being pushed on you by big pharma. Uh, Anti-big pharma, by the way, is sort of a, like a, a, a thing of the left. But our problem with big pharma isn't that they made a vaccine for measles, right? <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> our, our problem with them is that they're part of a for-profit healthcare system that excludes people who don't have enough money to get healthcare. And those people have bad healthcare outcomes, including death. That is not the same as the measles vaccine is going to make your kids <laughs> autistic, right? That's yeah, a, that, that's right. One of them is a structural critique. The other one is just some bonkers conspiracy shit. But I, we also notice this. We will not, we do not consent is like a talking point. And that as far my as body, I can my tell, choice. <laughs> my, well, that is a bit of a, I don't like maybe, maybe bad faith is the wrong way to talk about it. Considering we have a podcast that the tagline is, entering the marketplace of ideas in bad faith, but it's, <laughs> they're kind of making fun of pro-abortion people in a way. Yeah. Oh no, they're definitely like using it, uh, counterintuitively. Right. Right. And you know, um, pregnancy isn't contagious unless you're fucking everybody. And, but that's not the pregnancy that's contagious. That's just pheromones or something. Um, <laughs> but you know, we do not consent came out of the chemtrails movement. They were saying, we don't consent to being sprayed. And it's like, well, that's good because that's just fucking ice crystals behind an airplane, you idiot. Mm, you know, mm. it forms a cloud. Yes, but that's a cloud is also just ice crystals. It's just the <laughs> byproduct of burning kerosene. And one of the main byproducts is water, you fool. But it's, yeah, it's nothing different. Um, a good follow on this stuff is uh, David Gorsky, uh, Gorkson on uh, Twitter. He works for science-based medicine. Um, and he draws parallels because he's been arguing with anti-vaxxers for a long time too. He's a medical doctor and a, a, me a medical researcher. So his background in it right. is not mine. I'm a troll, but, uh, he's, he's a real good <laughs> follow. And yeah, it's, it's, you know, the, the language of conspiracy theory doesn't ever really change. It's just that the sort, like the movements kind of ebb and flow for a long time. The flat earth thing was big, which is bizarre. Um, before that, maybe chemtrails was big. And the anti-fluoride thing seems to have largely gone away, but that was kind of in the ether too. And it's just the same rhetoric. It's like they, and you know, they is pretty loaded because it usually means Jewish folks. Um, right. And, but they're doing this to you. Your friends are un unawake, unaware. Your friends are too stupid to figure it out, but you've cracked the code. And that's sort of the allure. Like the thing that I think draws people into conspiracy movements is you, they can, you know, it's, it's, it's a simple answer to a complex world. And not only is it a, is a simple answer, but you done figured it out and your friends yeah. and your neighbors are too stupid to figure it out. So you get to be smart, you get to have the answer and you get to be fighting against something that doesn't exist. So like you can't lose because it doesn't exist. Right. Right. The, it, it makes me think of like, uh, the re one of the things they said about, uh, people in QAnon is that you could be a hero by posting online. Mm -hmm. Like you are fighting the fight. You're an online, a digital soldier, right? And it's yeah. very much similar. 
the other thing that goes on there is I was talking to you about it. There's a this great guy. I, I interview him like every couple of years. He's like a busy guy. And uh, me and him, we see eye to eye on a lot of stuff, but I don't have him on all the time. His name is John Atack. He's from the UK. He's a former Scientologist. He's been talking about Scientology on TV since the 80s, kind of get, the 80s. He's kind of getting up there in years. But we were kind of hashing out the last time I interviewed him, this idea of um, QAnon specifically, but maybe even more broadly conspiracy movements being like cults. But instead of like a Scientology where there's David Miscavige or previously L. Ron Hubbard at the top, you have this like decentralized network of little cult leaders where they, instead of having millions of followers, each of them has maybe 10 or 12 or maybe 100,000 followers. And right. then people are members of these different sorts of groups with these different sorts of cult leaders. And we were sort of talking about it as the difference between, you know, downloading a file from Microsoft or whatever, or getting it via BitTorrent and how mm -hmm. this new model is like a more distributed version of a cult with like a lot of different smaller cult leaders. And it's, you know, neither of us have really hashed the idea out in our own minds yet, I don't think, but it's sort of interesting to think about it that way. Yeah, for sure. Like I can definitely see the uh, the analogy between uh, QAnon, like you say, and and BitTorrent, because you have the file is being downloaded by multiple people, and then also uploaded by those same people to whoever else wants to download it. So it's like, yeah, very much like online piracy. <laughs> right, and, and but the the problem with that, and I'm I'm kind of glad that to the extent that it was like a centralized thing that it's gone away. Um, I understand that the movement's not gone. There's that weird thing in Dallas with that negative 48 cult. Those, I hope those people don't ride the comet, but I'm getting the impression that that's how that's going to end. Either they're going to ride the comet or they're going to start abusing one another. Cause that's kind of how those right. uh, organizations work. Um, but I'm glad that it has largely gone away because it was getting scary for a while. I don't know if you, you kind of kept up on, there was this case and I, I'm sorry, I forget the name of the person, but they were like trying to save some children from someone. They like got in a car chase and like ran somebody off the road because they mm -hmm. thought the person was like abusing the children in the car. And it was like it was getting to the point where it, these people were like taking action against imaginary child abusers. Yeah. Yeah. And there were there were people who were planning on like raiding orphanages and shit. And luckily they got oh, stopped. And it's like, you know, an orphanage probably ain't the best place, but like the last thing those kids need is like a bunch of violent lunatics coming in to try to rescue them. Cause then where do they put these kids after they take them out of the orphanage? Like, what's the plan, man? The plan don't go nowhere good. They're probably end up doing the same thing. They're accusing the orphanage of doing, you know, a little too concerned with a little too worried about orphan kids, you know, a little too worried, maybe yeah. telling on yourself a bit there. You obsessed with child abuse. Are you? Hmm. It, it might say something. It might, it might, but. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's real. It's, it's, it's real. It's real hard to, you know, it's, it's real hard to follow this stuff and not despair. And, uh, you know, I, I, I hope we do a good enough job <laughs> with it that, that, uh, people aren't like having too much despair. You know, we, we play a few cat videos here and there. <laughs> Try to Well, there you go. You got to get some hope from the cat videos. <laughs> Definitely. Well, on to foes and comrades. Um, for foes, you have the Weinsteins, which we've already kind of discussed, but yeah, um, mostly Brett, um, even though Eric's more fun to make fun of cause he gets much more angry. Um, I, from my soundboard, he's like, he's talking about Sam Cedar, of course. Um, but Brett, yeah, he's a big foe. He's been a pretty popular anti-vaccine propagandist and was telling people to take uh, ivermectin and there's two problems with that one. There's really no evidence that ivermectin helps anybody with COVID-19. Um, right. But also the second order there, and I think we're not going to see it right away, is that if somebody does have a parasitic infection going forward and a doctor prescribes them ivermectin, they might be hesitant to take it because they're like, that's quack shit. Even though it's not quack shit if it's prescribed for, for example, <laughs> river blindness, which it basically got rid of. It It's... Yeah cheap effective and it eradicated river blindness and it's good for a lot of parasitic infections but i think the second order effect there might be that people will be hesitant to take it because of all the bullshit that was floating around it you know during covid and so that's you know brett is brett's a bad person his wife's a bad person and 
One of the things that's kind of common between both of the, the Weinsteins is they believe they've revolutionized some um, aspect of science. Uh, Brett thinks that he learned something about telomeres. I don't have a background in biology to like really explain oh, it, but there's yes, a lot of- Yes, I think I've heard of- I listened to Decoding the Gurus, so they've kind of yeah, talked yeah. about that a bit. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. And, um, but there's a lot of good takedowns by people in that field that one could take a look at, but he claims he revel. Him and his brother claim that Brett revolutionized biology and some woman stole his idea or whatever. And then Eric claims that he unified physics by himself in his spare time. And that's harmless, but that's fucking wackadoodle shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> like nobody discovers anything by themselves anymore. Like we have teams of people working on everything. And that's good, yeah. actually, because then, you know, when you have a team of people, like crackpot ideas are less likely to get out there because the other people on your team might be like, maybe let's not go in that direction. So yeah, those are, those are probably our biggest foes. Um, we have, uh, <clears throat> we call the room Brett broadcasts from, we call it the galaxy brain humidor because it looks oh, yeah. like, a, looks like a cigar shop a little bit. And we yep. wonder there's a, there's a sink in the background and, uh, the people in my chat are like 50, 50 on whether or not the sink's hooked up to anything or if it's just a prop, but when they get busted, <laughs> maybe they're tax evading or whatever. When they get busted, he does have this lamp that's, uh, on like an old parking meter that I really want. Okay. <laughs> I don't want the skulls that he has there because I think he practices phrenology on the skulls that he's got on his um on his set. But yeah, those I are gen it. those are like uh, foes of mine in this. And um, <clears throat> one time I I tweeted out a bunch of stuff about one of Brett's things, and he uh, sub or he like quote tweeted me, and then a bunch of his dork fans tried to come after me, and then a lot of them ended up blocking me. And one of the guys from the gurus was like, "Hey, are you all right? These people are coming after you." I'm like, "This is the best thing that ever happened." <laughs> I was like, "I'm here for this." I was like, these dorks are coming after me and then complaining that I'm being mean to them. This is exactly what I want. Can we do this every yeah. day? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but that was nice. It was nice of them to reach out though, because I know like people do get harassed in it. A lot people, a lot of people aren't really ready for it. Whereas like, that's my goal actually is to get popular people's fans <laughs> to come right. after me. And, yeah. uh, and then, uh, on the comrades, I'm all taking over the hosting job. The comrades yeah. is science-based medicine, particularly uh, David Gorski goes by Gorkson on um, Twitter. Also uh, Stephen Novella who runs science-based medicine and does the skeptics guide to the universe podcast. Uh, those are comrades there. If I don't know what's going on with something, some kind of medical thing, some kind of, I just go there. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, over the years they've shown themselves to be very trustworthy. And when they do get it wrong, they just correct it right away. And it's at the top of the article, not the bottom. And yeah, so that's right. So, so if anybody's looking, if anybody's like, doesn't know what's going on with something kind of in the ether, that's about medicine. And it seems like everybody's arguing, just go check science-based medicine. They're not right a hundred percent of the time, but it's close enough that it's for the average person. It's a, it's a pretty good resource. Yep. I got, sure. I, I got my mom on that shit and she's been reading an article a day ever since I showed it to her. So oh, nice. Yeah. That's awesome. That used to be like one of my main go-tos for research topics. Uh, I would always they would always have a science-based medicine uh, link related to the subject I was talking about. Oh yeah. They're great. They're great. And they, you know, I I'm not under the impression that the people writing there are raking in the dough off that website. They probably make more ad money than I do, but they're not raking in the dough on there and there's no Patreon links or anything on there. I think a skeptic's guide to the universe has a Patreon, but they, yeah. you know, their show just keeps getting the quality of their show just keeps getting better and better and better. And I think they're putting all the money from Patreon back into the show. I'm right. guessing that none of the people on there are really hurting for money based on their uh, career trajectories. Right. Yeah. They're not exactly. Yeah. They're all have very good jobs. They know what they've been doing them for a long time. So. Yeah. Right. I, so wish I, I, guess, I wish I wish I had more to say about my foes, but I think anybody maybe who's watching this and is familiar with the Weinsteins probably knows. And if you want to learn more about like what we have to say about the Weinsteins, in the intellectual dark web, check out the intellectual dollar tree. My co-host HK is also really good. Um, maybe in a, maybe in a few months, if you're looking for another guest, I'll send HK on here. He's also been a guest on uh, X's show, Utah Outcasts. So nice. Yeah, and he's got a proper setup as well, and red lights. <laughs> cool. Uh, I guess we said it at the start, but at the close, we might as well do it again. Where can people find your content? Um, the best place to look is my website. It's echoplexmedia.com. It's got links to everything. Um, I'm sure in your show notes, you'll put a link to my Twitter. My Twitter's good, but check the tweets and replies. Cause like the main feed isn't really where it's at. You got to see who I'm, uh, you got to see <laughs> who I'm got to have the replies. <laughs> you got to see who I'm talking to. And, um, our Twitch channel is really good. We're 
uh, certainly a leftist Twitch channel, but we're not talking theory. We don't talk a lot of electoral politics. Our focus has always been on cults, high control groups, extremism, and conspiracy communities. And so people do come in there and they're like, it says politics. What are you talking about Scientology for? I'm like, this is political. Just watch. But if because you're everything is politics <laughs> and you know, if you're, if, if you're, if you have a certain impression of the leftist Twitch space where it's just a bunch of infighting and clout chasing and stuff, and you kind of don't like it, I think you could land on our channel. And if we are, if we do any clout chasing, we make it pretty clear. That's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure what the whole infighting going on on Twitch or YouTube or Twitter. I, I try, I don't tend to pay that close attention, but. Hopefully people can get something good out of watching your channel or, or mine. Yeah. And I guess like, I don't know where else to, f oh, Grindr. You can find me on Grindr. <laughs> you want to add that link into the show notes? <laughs> I don't think Grindr works that way, but if you're in the, if you're in the West oh, Valley, okay. whatever, just filter for 45, 45 years old and find me. And if, I don't know, I don't know if you're hot, maybe I'll reply to your message. There you go. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. This was fun. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or RateMyPodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist Humanist Leftist Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves. <laughs>